Well, great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to introduce everyone that's participating. There's a, a couple groups um, that are participating. Welcome everyone to the Library Makerspace Tours. This is our fourth tour and most of them are available on our website so you can go back and watch them. So we're recording this as well so you can review anything that we learn today in the future. Um, generally how these operate are they're pretty informal. The whole purpose is so that we can actually share informal knowledge with one another just like we would if we were all hanging out together in a community makerspace environment except we're so far spread apart especially those of us here in the West, um, where for me, the nearest academic library makerspace is either in Moscow, Idaho, nine hours north, or it's at University of Nevada, Reno, which is about, I want to say you're six hours south of us. So um, driving, driving that is. Um, there's really nothing else close by to us out here in the West. And so um, I first met Todd Colgrove at uh, Internet Librarian in 2012, when we started talking about makerspaces and I'm just so thrilled to have Tara Radniecki and Todd Colgrove talk to you about what they do and with that being said I will stop talking for now and I'll we'll ask questions later and I'll pay attention to the chat Todd and Tara please take it away super and, and I'll just point out Amy and anyone joining feel free to jump in with any questions and interrupt that's much better than having a thought stuck in your head keeping you from asking the questions as we're going along just want to sweep across the, the quad quickly to show that we're, you're joining us right now at the end of that really slow motion train wreck that we all call the spring semester. And so uh, forgive us the, the, the little bit of chaos that you'll see within the makerspace. Again, the last day of finals is today and folks are just wrapping up. So come on into the, into the Mackey uh, School of Mines building, which is the, uh, again, it's the one of the oldest buildings on campus, and interestingly, in the DMA Library, it houses one of the most novel introductions. Walking through the tallest doors on campus, nothing to do with the size of the egos of the people that come in. Okay. Well, you start to get a sense that this might not be a very traditional sort of library. It's looking a little bit sketchy perhaps. And then the long ramp that was part of the retrofit in the 90s that squeezed in a few more floors. We'll come right into the door of the library. Where you T-bone into the service desk. And I'll introduce my uh, colleague, Nick Crowell, who's makerspace manager, not at all expecting this ambush. <laughs> but we're just going to sort of go from one service to the next. And one of the first services that we offer is that of a human being that sees you when you walk in, smiles, and makes a connection. In fact, Nick is sitting at the desk that's normally occupied by a student wrangler, uh, whose job is to help engage you. If you have an idea for something that you want to do, but aren't entirely sure how to get there, this would be a first one. So actually, Nick, if you've got a minute, would you, you had something going on the laser cutter that we ask you to pause for a minute just to give us a, uh, an example. Sorry to interrupt, I'm just thinking, we're all interested in the nasty, so Nick's absolutely right. He's working on a gift that, that he uh, asked him to create for a speaker. And so what you're seeing on the screen is actually the raster, not the raster, but the vector outline of what's going to be cut out of the piece of wood before it gets finished. This is a side view of a stylized Burning Man logo along with a flaming question mark on top. The speaker series that the library hosts is called Burning Inquiry, which is associated with the Burning Man event, which is held about a couple of hours out in the desert of the That's it. Star Wars, but we'll see. Now this is some kind of finished we can see it great. I just want to say if you turn your head away, it's really hard for us to hear you. But um, so well, 
th just that's my only comment so far. If that's okay for me to interrupt. And so for yeah. that, since, we, in, since I've interrupted to begin with, I'll start with it. others nasty details that you see, including the schedule that has all the people that are booking it and using it. This laser cutter is easily the most heavily used resource in the library. Even here at the end of the semester, when finals are all tight, tangled up, it's booked all the way up to the end of our day today. Uh, so we're just lucky that Nick put this book to get this out of the book. That said, if you can include all the details of the operation. Sure. So this right here is our uh, exhaust system that's going to pull out all the smoke, the fumes, and it'll filter out pretty much anything except for uh, chlorine. So PVC and things like that, we can't allow in here, but for wood, acrylic, and all the normal stuff, it does a great job. It does make a lot of noise, so apologies in advance. We'll turn it off real quick. <laughs> So while that's wrapping and getting down to a, a quiet spot, there's another uh, pump that's associated with this, a little compressor, and its job is to blow out the flame. As that laser cutter is cutting the material, it directs a jet of air right where the laser is cutting so that we don't get a big conflagration happening in here and the fire extinguishers have to come out. And you can see along the wall lots of pieces that have come out of it. The hydro flasks are amazingly popular, and this is Gateway Drug 101 to get kids involved with the makerspace and developing the new literacies that they need to acquire, like vector and raster images and where do you go? Also, one of, another one of my favorites is this uh, snow speeder that was created by a student that graduated last year. It was a combination of the 3D modeling that he crossed off into the 2D world of vector cutting and combined with some plywood I think he said he got that at Hobby Lobby and was able to go from there along with other examples of all the different types of things that students have tried and failed with or tried and learned as Tara would point out if you write down the settings that work then it's no longer an art it's become a science and so we're helping our students do what they're doing on the way this is a, a frame of one of the Lamps, whether you're doing it in leather, paper. Take a look at this. And this is a particularly fun example, and it's of what happens when art students bump up against engineering students and they start playing together. This was an art student that realized that he could start using these makerspace tools to create art in a deeper way. And it also, you'll, you'll recognize the Disney theme there. It was an opportunity for Tara as intellectual property librarian to sort of wade in and talk about that and say, hey, wow, let's talk about copyright and how that works and where it goes and, and while this might be covered by fair use and what might not be. So uh, for what it's worth, we're hitting on all four cylinders of this particular ember. Then on the side, you've got one of our five, six 3D printers that are working on. This is a Stratasys 3D printer that we've had operating here since Gosh, mid-2012, so that's uh, a little over six years now, and it just keeps plugging along like an old diesel tractor. I'll go ahead and pause it. I have to point out, if you look at the screen here, right there, mm -hmm. you can see that it's called, the job number is black underscore 1188. Not a lot of personally identifiable information in that, nor is there personally identifiable information up here on the job tracking that enables us to figure out that it's gone through each of the steps that it needs to happen. It was created, it was paid, it got printed, then it got soaked and infiltrated, contacted and picked up. So again, librarians are soft and squishy about a lot of things, but we're pretty serious about your personal information, like what is the job that's being printed? We don't want to expose anyone's intellectual property inadvertently. And again, opening it up, you can see a lot of the interesting surfacing. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, you all probably are already operating with this sort of technology, but for the love of Mike, you need something that can just go. Don't mess around too much with the entry-level 3D printers that are just going to cause some Those are fun to have on the side, but you need something that gets the day work done. 
what we find that. And then again, other examples of uh, things that we used to call the box of disillusionment, tales and somewhere or another, everything from topological maps that are now growth of the geosciences to this is a, a model of, as I understand it, how your DNA replicates itself. Each of these represent basically atoms in a molecule and the atoms that need to lock together are BBs. They would fall right into the right spot and link together as this would twist around and crank out an identical set of DNA. Uh, two examples that were left behind, these folks wanted to figure out how they could mount a camera to a drone and isolate the vibrations. And you'll notice the, the rubber bumpers in there. This is an outgrowth of, of a student coming in with an idea, working with the Wranglers, trying to figure out how to do what they wanted to do and taking it to the next step. Oh, another example, actually, these are the, this is the- uh, Humming dog. That even worked. No, the, what, the plaster was well, the model the at work. Was. Failed prototype right a here. Failed prototype, right? It holds their, uh, the iPhone microphone in here, couples it with the business end of the stethoscope so that you can, an expected mother can actually record the sounds of the heartbeat of the, of the unborn infant, or the ailing parent can record the sounds of their lungs or heartbeat and send it to their physician. Actually, that's an example of something that became quite real. And, and turns it into a thing. And coming back over here, Andres, who actually is one of our Wrangler students, uh, has been testing <laughs> the uncomfortable service. <laughs> Andres, quick introduction though, if you don't mind, what are you studying? What are you doing? Uh, I'm doing computer science and information systems. I'm part of the engineering and the business world here. <laughs> what are the sorts of things that folks walk in and ask you? What, what's your art um, point? So, with the Wrangling, it's really about what you were saying earlier. It's about taking a student's idea and trying to change it into something a little bit more tangible. And you know, sometimes they come in with an idea that has to do with one of their senior projects or something that's personal. It's something they just want something held in their room or uh, something they can use in their room. So it's really not, it's really awesome to be part of their experience and have them come in here and say, hey, I have this idea and what can we do to make this real? And you know, I can kind of give them suggestions. You know, well, you can, you can utilize a laser cutter over here, or you know, we can make something as simple as some stickers to get your idea going. And it's, you know, it's all a bit of a process to make something. That's excellent. And one of the things that that Andres and the other students often hear from us as librarians is, you're not stealing their fun, are you? <laughs> I mean, that the, the whole point of it is not to do the work of the people coming in. This isn't a shop where you come in and say, I'd like 20 stickers made that say this. It really is all about learning those and developing those literacies yourself as a student or a faculty member or a member of the staff or the greater community. When they come in, our job is to, is to help them help themselves. Now, if you've got a minute, you, you've got some stickers going yeah, on there. <laughs> Bit loud, but I have some uh, university related stickers screening out here. We are taken straight from images from our school, and the computer already traces the images for you. So, very easy process. You just let the machine do the work, and then after you'll do some a little bit of personal work on cutting it out. And you've also got, what are all these different pretty colors? So this is a selection of vinyl. These vinyls right here are for regular stickers that you can put on uh, any walls or anything like that. And these, th and these vinyl in the back are adhesive vinyl here, which is what students use to put on to t-shirts or any kind of clothing. Oh, it's a heat transfer vinyl. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to make a t-shirt like this. Yeah, yeah. We get a lot of the preparing students coming in here for the big letters. And and we are absolutely not above leveraging the fact that they're rushing into a fraternity to help introduce them to information literacy. So one of the things I have to point out, I, I'm noticing this over on the side. This yeah. is kind of a hack, isn't it? Mm -hmm. This is so a the vinyl cutter has more capabilities than just cutting through vinyl. Uh, we are able to attach a pen to it, 
and instead of using the trace to cut through the vinyl, we used the trace to trace whatever picture that they have here. So this one took quite a bit of time to actually make. But um, yeah, it's really amazing what this laser cutter can do, or this vinyl cutter can do. I have to point out, we as librarians had no idea it could do this. Mm -hmm. This was something that Andres figured out on his own. It's like, yay, that's totally awesome. And right underneath it, another <laughs> sticker. Two things. If you don't have a vinyl cutter in your makerspace, get one. They're dirt cheap. They're hugely powerful in terms of introducing things into space. Point two is you will find stickers showing up in the most unlikely places. So just for what it's worth, if you're a, if you're a, a neat company, uh, you might want to provide a space. Otherwise, they'll show up like they did in our space everywhere. Now, Tara was just leaning over another piece of equipment that I have to point out. This is a printed circuit board mill, which is another resource that we have here. A lot more specialized because this is if you're designing in computer science or electrical engineering a particular circuit and you need to be able to create it. Uh, this is the machine that can carve it out. So, as an example, a piece of scrap that's left over here. It, it carves out all of the traces that need to connect to one another and produces the circuit board. This is uh, also a tremendously powerful tool, although requires some specialized learning and care and feeding. If you're supporting electrical engineering, computer sciences, prototype development of brand new resources, things that have never existed before, this enables a researcher or a developer to create this and keep their intellectual property secure because they're the ones that are doing the printing of it right here locally as opposed to uploading the file to a service that is somewhere around the world and having to expose potentially their intellectual property. I also point out that the other thing that is sitting Just so you can see which brand we got. Oh, see if I can get up there. I'm not sure. Yes. If you have questions about this, let us know. We've made mistakes before. <laughs> and you know, it, it's worth mentioning that this is a resource that we couldn't have bought on our own as libraries. We actually had to go in, in codes with the Vice President of Innovation of Research and Innovations Office to get that funding to support it because this is a gizmo it was between twenty and thirty thousand dollars, wasn't it? Yes. And that's pretty darn pricey to be supporting one offs that might happen, you know, a few dozen times a semester. That's kind of a pricey cost for you. But at the same time, I'll have to point out, if you look at what's in there right now, pretty clearly this wasn't being used to carve out a printed circuit board the last time it was in use. It's a resource that these clever students and members of the community can figure out how to hack. So from that, actually, why don't we go to the other resource from the VPRI's office, uh, the 3D scanner? Uh, and actually, we don't mind. We'll trade hands here because. <laughs> what, what, what are you saying? That little right down there. Okay, good, good. good. Okay. So this is another resource that was was per, was purchased, utilizing funds with the vice president of research and innovations office. The the Artec scanners are high end scanners that are quite robust. They work. They cost on the order of twenty to twenty five thousand dollars. And yet they're easily one of the more heavily used resources that we have in the library. Again, Tara is demonstrating this because she's the only one that has the appropriate skill set to be able to make, make this work, I, or at least out of the two of us. I've never successfully been able to pull this off. But Tara, Nick, all of the 3D Wranglers are able to successfully not only uh, create the scans, but to capture them in a 3D model that can then be remixed and turned into something entirely else. So you see it's gonna go ahead and map the textures and pull up the model. Do you mind me asking, I'm just gonna interrupt, I have a few questions, but yeah, can I start with it? I'm curious if you could uh, tell us a little bit about the software that you're using that goes with that model and did the software come along with that price tag or which, what have you tried to do? That's my first question. Yes. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Yeah, the software that uh, it's proprietary. It's called the Artex Studio. We're on the version of Artex Studio 12 professional. It comes with the scanners. Um, it allows you to do quite a bit of editing after the fact. So of course the scan wasn't super clean. But if we were doing 
actually wanting a clean model of myself, there would be several scans, we'd mesh them together, we'd clean up some holes, um, and there's a lot of capabilities within this software program. And then it can be exported into your various CAD type files if you wanted to manipulate it further in a SOLIDWORKS program. And it's worth mentioning that we took that to another level, although we needed that license to be able to run it in a one-off. We actually went back and purchased an entire bundle of licenses yeah. so that we could be legal with our researchers when they're, when they're uh, checking the, the, the scanner out and using it in their lab spaces and doing the development. So as an example, we have researchers in the psychology department that have library licenses uh, of the Artec scanner software installed because they're such heavy users of it. The same in the geosciences and other disciplines that are supporting it. So what are you working on in particular there, Tara? Well, so this is just a really quick scan of my face. However, there's lots of ways that we can edit it within the program. Uh, it's well worth, I have better scans than this. <laughs> uh, so you could take this then and pull it into a 3D model. Right, we can, we can and... see it's hollow in the back. So if we wanted, when we do a full body scan, we do have a essentially a large lazy Susan, for a better lack of a term. Um, that we can this comes under the heading of don't try this at home right we're very lazy seasons here uh if the optic is small we have a very small one you can see it's covered in baby powder because the 3d scanners do not like shiny objects uh, so if we're doing something metal or a remote read all shiny doesn't even like hair uh we'll be covering it in baby powder to create the, the scan on this one, we can see we have all of these X's, and that's the, essentially the reference points for the 3D scanner. So if we have an object on here and we slowly start turning it, the 3D scanner needs these to be able to lock onto so that it knows where it is as it's scanning, and it gets a much better image. And so this is something that our tech wranglers <laughs> just discovered over time really helps with the quality of the scan. And so if you're scanning a person or an extended object, yes. if we've scanned sculptures i think i'm not sure have we lost the video uh there was a no a, a question that came in oh. i think Amy, yes I'm not sure. yes the Did question you... is which scanner is it that you use and i think it's the arctic artec eva is that the one yes yeah, and we have a the artex spider i'm sorry say that one more time sorry we also have the artex spider so the eva is made for the one that we just demoed for you made for larger scale type 3D scanning. So a person, something, um, it's scanned airplanes. So it's done various objects. Whereas the spider, if you look up the Artex spider, uh, it's made to gather, catch detail on a much smaller scale. So it's uh, the one that we're using to do fossils. Um, it'll do the face of a, of a, a penny very right. well. Uh, so yeah. it'll catch much more fine detail, but it uses a different technology. So it doesn't actually work very well on large objects. And in terms of, of accessibility and availability of this, it's a $25,000 widget. We're a little more sensitive in terms of who's checking it out and how freely we let it go. But you can see on the surface of it, there's the library barcode, there's the ins instructions to ourselves, right? Don't forget, new 3D scanner checkout procedures, da 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 da. And then we can go ahead and open this guy. Where it keeps it all nice, safe, and secure. Even, even so, if you're, and this, these are easily the, the most viable scanners that we've found, mm -hmm. and we've worked with, a, with a, a number of them. Even so, they periodically uh, get broken. Uh, so if you're going down this road, one of the things that we added separately was uh, a, uh, a hot swap package that was not cheap. It was on the order of $1,500 a year. But when the scanner gets dropped, and this is something that our makerspace manager, Nick Krell, figured out, we can ship that off again, get it repaired, uh, and they send us a hot swap replacement. Can you speak a little more to that one, Nick? How does that work? And, and what is the real cost? Because I just made up a number. Uh, the cost of the repairs? Of the yeah. hot swap thing. For, and, and the cost of repairs. Um, I believe the hot swap program was about $2,000 for, what was it, a year's worth of service, and that it also covers the cost of any damages to the scanner, as well as we contact the company and they next day air us the replacement. And that's helpful in this case because Absolutely. the vendor is based out of uh, 
I want to say Luxembourg. Yeah, so you have to ship it across the Atlantic. You have to go through customs and everything. It's not a quick repair. And so having someone nearby in California where they can ship you a replacement one and you can be back up and running again is, is very powerful. So I interrupted. Very good, very good. I'll hand this back to Tara, who is far more adept than I. Okay, so we talked about the scanning. And how often do you say do folks start with the scanner and then end up with the 3D printer? I say almost every time. Almost every time. Almost every time they bring in something okay. that's you know kind of uh, an idea model, right. and they really want this to be more detailed. Yes. And so they say, can we 3D scan this and possibly make changes to it, or you know, update it? So they'll way. remix it. Mm -hmm. oh, interesting. And so. Once we scan it in, make it if we want, we'll use one of the 3D printers, depending on what kind of material or how, what, how they want it, you know, right. flexible or not. Right. And then once it comes out, they can look at it and say, okay, this is exactly what I want. So when people come in and they've got an idea, how often would they say, well, I need something that's kind of like this, but it needs this done to it? Yeah, I mean, oh, even, okay. you know, even uh, businesses come here that are not too far away from the campus. Right. And say, you know, we have this problem in our facility. Yeah, yeah. And we it's a little, you know, we need, ah. we need something on our belt or something that, you know, uh, similar to mm -hmm. other objects in stores. Mm -hmm. And they say, you know, we kind of want to make it our idea and you know, try and get a patent on it as well. Like that could happen, actually. We're standing right around the corner. Yeah. Not to throw Tara under the bus, but as, as the uh, patent and trademark librarian here at the University, the uh, University of Nevada Reno is a patent and trademark repository. And so Tara goes to patent school regularly to be up to speed here. That sort of interaction that Andres was just talking about happened often enough that the last thing that I heard was something on the order of 20 to 30 provisional patents. You had some sort of glancing interaction with as they come through. And actually, if you can show those resources, it happens often enough that we've got this right behind the service desk. So Andres or the rangers can say, oh, hey, let me show you this and share this card and come back and touch base. That's so amazing. That's truly, truly remarkable. I just want to interrupt to say that. That's great. And if anybody wants more information um, about which kind of books will be most helpful. In particular, um, look at this one. Right? Oh, yes, yes. Um, you can always just let us know. Um, those of us who are PTRC librarians, patent and trademark resource librarians, the USPTO gives us a nice list and we're happy to share that with other libraries. Um, this is something that's of critical importance. Um, knowing who is Hold it right next to this. <laughs> right. The who owns the IP. And so this is uh, we need a clarification about who owns the IP uh, of things that are made on campus. Oh my gosh. Uh, this goes through that. This is also a document that required some brokering with the vice president of research and innovations office but it's also available electronically uh, we could forward a copy to you mm -hmm. if anyone is interested it but makes, it's critical path yes and we also have it linked uh, and we also have a makerspace intellectual property policy which is really just guidelines about who owns the, the property points to this document um, about how we protect it and what options there are for people who create intellectual property in our space as far as helping and learning more about it and there's another sticker randomly <laughs> on the wall. Oh, and if you, if we can look back here, I, I want to go side, screeching sideways to something else that's relatively common in the space. This we just introduced last year and it was just terribly busy. And look at what a terrible mess this is. You see soldering irons and helping hands and yes, it is lead free solder along with the, the supporting equipment and the glasses. We have right now three soldering stations within the library. Throughout this past semester, there were times when all three were full. Our lendable soldering irons were also very heavily oh, checked out. I have to point out this one piece of equipment and share a story from a faculty member in mechanical engineering that will help you encourage your, your community members to stay safe. Uh, when Professor Greiner walked through the space, he noticed that the student was over here soldering without using the, the protective glasses. And he took me aside and said, you know, I know that you guys warn them, 
but here's a story you can tell him that will help. He said, let him know that last year he had a faculty member in mechanical engineering that was soldering without glasses. And he had to go to the emergency room where they had to literally dig the small pieces of solder out of his eyeball with a needle. And you probably don't want to go there. So if you're supporting soldering, feel free to use that with, with his permission. It will, it will keep you out of the wheel. That's it. This is heavily used. And note the other, uh, the, the heat shrink tool associated with the soldering iron controls. Very powerful stuff when you're supporting electrical engineering and so on. Right next to the heat, heat presses for the heat transfer vinyl. So depending on what's happening when this stuff shifts side to side, and it might all of a sudden become an area that's devoted to heat transfer on the t-shirts, uh, which is where this household iron comes in to use. That's also pretty regularly used in conjunction with good old fashioned sewing. And before we started, Amy was sharing some of her tips in terms of finding replacement parts like the clear bobbin uh, for the uh, sewing machine that oddly regularly goes missing. And as you, if you sweep around, you can see some of the tables that are covered with this thick plastic to try to bulletproof the table services when they get caught, cut on and drilled on, along with a full range of colors, Lego parts and mindstorms, because you're never quite sure what's going to trigger that imagination and innovation. And if you can see across the back, you can see cabinets that are full of lendable technology, including associated bits like this guy that's the rotary tool for the laser cutter. Why is it barcoded and locked up in the cabinet? It's not because the library needs more circulation stats. It's because we learned the hard way that if someone plugs that into the laser cutter without first turning it off, it fries the motherboard. So this forces the conversation with our service desk to say, hey, let, before you use this, let's make sure you turn that laser cutter off and everyone will be happy. Okay. The, the tools along here are very, very useful, super helpful for the students that are in mechanical engineering, regardless of what they're working on. Everything from uh, wood burning kits to glue gun kits to regular screwdrivers and so on. And uh, the students regularly point out that we try to discourage folks from cutting themselves, even though we've got lots of sharp pieces. And we do have chain mail gloves as well. Useful, useful stuff. And coming back over here, one of the other resources that we didn't talk about was one of the traditional resources that the library has offered since it started, which is this large format poster printer. Uh, these printers will print on up to five feet wide uh, photograph quality, archival quality actually materials. So if you wanted to, you could do a billboard on the side of the building. You could also print out your scientific poster or your artwork. I think in conjunction with, with the at one uh, space uh, north of campus here, we print between five and 7,000 posters every year. So it's very heavily used. In fact, you can pan up just a bit, you can see some more intentional stickers that we use within the space, like you may have noticed over the laser cutter. It's very helpful to just sort of brand the, the, the area of the library with what it's sort of suggested we do. Then if we can sort of loop through here, we can go through the laser, the, the 3D printer. This printer that I know is just being broken up. Apparently a project is coming in. You probably already, in fact, Amy, I think you have a number of Lulzbot minis. Uh, this is the, the Tazbot, heavily used. The best feature about it, though, is that it's open and accessible, so people can get right in there and burn themselves. Mm -hmm. Somehow that, that helps the students feel like they can do stuff, not that, not that we're encouraging them. When you go over to the side of the room, you Because again, it's a smoking hot mess in the library because we're just at the end of the semester. The point out is we're walking here to whiteboard walls. Even though throughout the library, the library is about 23,000 square feet of floor space. We have a, over 23,000 square feet of whiteboard writable surfaces in the library. Critical path in a matrix. But it's along with things like there's a, a, a vehicle that was designed and built for running band by one of our, our physics uh, uh, folks. It actually has at least four different types of engineering. 
darker side of chemistry and physics because it was modeled after one of the early, one of the only atomic weapons ever used in warfare. Then it goes out to Burning Man. So it's the sort of thing that we would park in the middle of the library and all of us can geek out over. Right next to a range of other printers that are shoved over here in, in this big mess. <laughs> Along with, again, these are a bunch of art projects that are going back to students even today that were produced and were featured, they're lamps actually, uh, that were hanging over the atrium of the library for the last three weeks of the semester. This printer in the back corner is prints way out of a, a it, it's a combination of SLS, it's, it's laser cutter functionality, but it shoots the laser over a bed of polymer powder and produces 3D printed objects that are very strong and also very resilient to high temperatures. So depending on what someone is trying to do. This one may be pulled out and put into you. Or this printer that prints objects out of plaster. You know, if you're dealing with an artistic model, uh, such as, or, or this, this skull that came from Africa, to a, a model from Star Wars, this might be an example of a printer that would be called in the US. To the Delta bot that's up on top of here comes in handy when we're going to uh, uh, demo things or table someplace and we want to have something that feels accessible and gets people talking to us. To the thing that is not a table that all this crap is sitting on, uh, but is a, a big boy version of the Stratus printer. So if we need particularly granular control over how the support material and the model material is printed, or just a bigger physical space where we can print an ABS uh, object, this is the printer that gets called in the wish. Now, Pulling back one second in the atrium that we walked through, I'll point out some of the new developments. You're fine. These are uh, VR and augment, virtual and augmented reality development workstations, right? Including the supporting materials that are here on the site. So if you want to come into the atrium and game, you're absolutely welcome to do so. Come into the atrium and continue the development work on the project that you're working on in Unity with the Alpha Plus Rift and HTC Vive, you're more than welcome to and we're glad to support it. One of the things I have to point out though is if you have multiple HTC Vive in your space, as we do, for the love of Mike, invest in some of these cheap little colored silicone skins that will help you keep the right parts with the right unit and you won't end up with two reds and two right. Again, feel free to contact us if you need any of this information. I couldn't zoom in. You can see how these are, are charging at the same time. So in addition to keeping them separate, you've got a nice place where you can land them. And they stay all charged, ready to go. So if someone is coming in and wanting to work with the, place, the computer, the high-end Alienware computers, along with several other computers and the monitors that are scattered throughout the library space. If you want to do that, that development work or the gaming work, one half of the Oculus and, and the bike is installed on the computer with the appropriate plugs. The other half of it is kept safely over in the uh, blendable technology cabinet. So someone will check it out and we'll be able to retake it. So if we come back over to the main desk again, I think we're kind of homing in on the end of the thing. Well, actually, that's a good image to close on. <laughs> Sorry, just going back to the entrance, but just sort of branding the entryway of the library where you can see we're just saying it's safe to make here. This is the kind of people that we are. We're waving our gig flag to resonate with that of our community. And these are all examples of things that we've caught happening in the library. And sooner or later, something gets done about it, but not today. That's it. Said, I don't know if you have any more questions. We can come into a more well lit area. Well, I'm going to call um, on everybody else to bring in their questions. They can either unmute their mic or chat them and I'll ask them. But I'm just going to ask a few questions because you referred to uh, how you want the tech wranglers to not essentially uh, rob other students and community members of the experience of making themselves. But then I saw that you also do charge for some things. How do you, and this might be a very long answer because I'm not sure if it's, it's one size fits all. How do you decide what people are allowed to use on their own and how, um, which things do you manage in terms of projects for other people? Is it a hybrid or is it one or the other? Do you do the yeah. laser cutting? That's, that's my first question. Complete hybrid. Um, yeah, before yeah. we answer that question, yeah. 
we're going to sit down in oh. an area that we should have talked about. Oh, right. Yeah. But these computers over on the side are a separate bank of computers that are right within reach of the Wrangler desk. And the function of these computers is when someone comes in and we've just given them that introduction to get them started with something or connect them with library resources that Wimba.com tutorials will have them and get them started. But they're close enough to where the Wrangler is and the rest of the staff are that we can still hold their hands to some extent. We can be available when they Well, I'm stuck. I'm not sure what to do. So going back to your, your, your question, Amy, you're, you're absolutely right. That's part of the thing. Of, we don't want to steal their fun because nothing is, frankly, nothing is easier when someone comes in and they want to do something. Nothing is easier for me than to just simply do it and move on to the next thing. Right? It's sort of like your mother might have said uh, to you when when she wanted you to clean up the room. She would get frustrated and just say, I'll just, I'll, just, I'll just do it. I'll just do it myself. That's what we're trying to avoid because the harder path, rather than taking the five minutes to create this 3D model and throw it into the queue and printer, the more difficult task is for us to take the three hour path where we sort of hold your hand and encourage you and introduce you to the software and the tools to get you to the point where you're now ready to take your own work and bring that back to our library services. So when it comes to creating the, the, the artwork, the 3D scan, the, the model that you're gonna print, the, the, the graphic that you're gonna cut out of a, a vinyl using the vinyl cutter or with the laser cutter, that's interaction A between the student wranglers and staff and the students. It requires them to learn some basic information literacy before they can go forward. Once they've got that image created, the vector outline done, the 3D model created, then they can come back to the other side of the desk where we handle it as a traditional library service. The end user comes in and presents and says, I have this model that I'd like to 3D print in ABS plastic or whatever the material is. How much will it be and how do I go about it? And the student on the other side of the desk will bring it into the modeling program, check it for any errors and be able to tell them or confirm them. Are you sure you wanted this to be printed three feet wide or should it be about three inches wide? Just some simple sanity checks in terms of scale material and then throw it into a calculator and say, this is how much we're gonna have to charge you for the material that we print with because the library is not allowed to make a profit on any of these services. But since we don't have a separate source of funding, we're required to recover the costs of the materials that we use. So if it's 3D printing, we know how much our service costs per square, per cubic inch of the model material, for instance, PPS plastic, and also per cubic inch of support material. Those go into the calculation and, and also the support of the student and staff time. It's all calculated into a spreadsheet. So we have to balance every year because again, do we have excess money, we have to go back and downgrade. I hope that that's coming close to answering your question, Amy. The other example would be whether we're 3D printing if you're talking about vinyl cutting, we've had to do the same sort of calculus. Well, how much does the material cost per linear foot or poster printing? It's the same sort of thing. So that once they present with their artwork that they've learned and developed themselves, then we can tell them we will have to charge them. So yeah, I have a follow-up question now too. So I don't know how um, it might help to share how many tech wranglers you have and then are they the folks that do the managing when you have those files i saw a couple places where you have the tracking uh, yeah. material up do, are they the ones that manage those um reservations and who gets paid do they take in the cash you have your own cash register i guess i'm just curious about those kinds of things because for many of us our maker space is a room in our library and so i um, or it's not even a room. For some of us, it's like a section, like a, an area, right? And so I'm just curious, um, who does that work? Because that it's been a limitation for us in terms of like how much use we're getting to start charging for things in our in our world. If that makes sense to you, it doesn't. It doesn't. The cost for the staffing doesn't doesn't match up. 
It absolutely does. I'm going to answer that by saying that between Tara and, and myself, we'll be able to speak to all of the facets of that question uh, because Tara has brought a tremendous amount of uh, approaches and new tools to the resource uh, that, that enable not only how we're managing the, the staffing, but how end users are able to manage their bookings. I was going to go sideways for the briefest instance, though, and, and point out that we're walking across the floor of the library, and this library has four floors. I've personally made it a core part of the library's mission that the entire space, all four floors of the library, is in fact makerspace because that's where the makers are. They might be working on a robot on the second floor or coming up with a new idea on the third floor or cutting things out in the basement. It's just that the bulk of our physical services are concentrated on this floor. We've kind of outgrown that, but we're actually beginning to spread that across the floors. A similar sort of problem comes when we're talking about this student staffing. Tara has heard me say on more than one occasion that there are three faculty members in the library and three staff members in the library and about 18 student staff. So it's pretty clear who's doing the bulk of the running of the library, and it's not the librarians. So our task is to rope everyone in under the same umbrella, make sure that we share the same uh, sensibilities and the same goals. When it comes to the student staffing, we have had two to three students at any given time that are, that are the designated wranglers. That said, we don't have the luxury because we're covering a library that's open from 7.30 in the morning until midnight on most days of the semester. We don't have the luxury or enough wranglers or funding for wranglers to be able to say those are the only times that we do it. So I'm pushing in the direction that all of our student workers are in fact wranglers and we're instead having a separate category that we're identifying uh, that can be paid a little bit extra. It can be paid nominally more than the entry level uh, students in terms of, of supporting to be more responsible. When, and in terms of who manages the, the Excel spreadsheet or the poster printing work form or the 3D printing work form, it's all the student workers. In fact, I would suggest, I know that I can say this about myself, may not be true about Jeff, but if you call me and say, I want to bring, I want to do a 3D print job today, I'm probably going to have to look at the cheat sheets in order to put the things in the right places. The student workers do it regularly in our field, but they're always on top. That's Tara awesome. Has, Tara's been able to go uh, to bring a lot of value, there, not ju beyond just that workflow. When it comes to scheduling the availability of the, of the, the laser cover or of the, the vinyl cover, the Can other bring up the reservation page? Uh, Tara's been able to, I'll, I'll actually step out of the way and let you speak for that. So if you want me to beam the light of truth on you? Oh, no, 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 that's okay. Really We're just going to come over here. Um, yeah, so as Todd mentioned, all students uh, who work in De La Mare Library um, have to have familiarity with, um, say, the laser cutter. Uh, they have to know how to make stickers. They have to essentially be able to do everything except for teach somebody how to 3D model. That's, and and uh, we only have a, a couple of students who are really adept with the PCB milling machine. Um, but other than that, uh, all the other students can process everything. Um, and that's just, again, like Todd said, it's a limitation of just not being able to afford to have tough wranglers all the time. Um, so this is, um, like Todd mentioned, oh, because you had asked about reservation. The wranglers themselves are yeah. a resource. Yeah, so um, this is the new, most of us use SpringShare out there in library land. Um, they used to have room bookings, and this is their new equipment and spaces module. Uh, and what's nice about this module is that you can book multiple things from the same page. It is not easy to set up, but it's been worth it. And why we wanted this is oftentimes people want to book a tech wrangler, and they want to get help with, uh, say, 3D scanning, or they want to get help with the laser cutter. But when they book a tech wrangler, we don't know what equipment they need, and we can't promise that it'll be in the library at that point in time. But here we can. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and scroll over. It's not. This is our last day of finals, so it's not very booked up, as we can see. Um, but 
tomorrow, you know, the laser cutter is, that's the red spots because that's our most popular. But somebody has the capability to book a tech wrangler and the piece of equipment that they want to get help with at the same time. So that's been really helpful. Uh, and this negates, there's no, um, um, any impetus on the student employees or anything to make these bookings. We don't have to waste time. This is something that the patron does completely themselves. It's all automated. Uh, we do at the end um, of every night shift um, or at the beginning of every morning shift, we print off what you saw the, um, the laser cutting schedule and we put that next to the laser cutter and that's something that can be easily printed off from the back end of this module. And I have to jump in and, and and point out the the novel use of a room booking software to schedule the, the student wranglers, the tech wranglers. Uh, that has been, again, the laser cutter is a very heavily used resource. If anything, I would suggest that the tech wranglers are, they're right up there. They certainly yes. challenge the laser cutter in terms of being heavily booked. When I've looked, when we've looked at the stats at the end of the semester, if the student, if we had what, maybe, 160 hours available, probably 140 of them were used. Right. Does that sound like it's in the next hour? Yeah, and we saw a really big Im uh, increase. So when I first started working here and we implemented a similar system, so about three years ago, I would say it was only 20% was pre-booked. Uh, and now we're up to a much larger percentage of pre-bookings. That's amazing. I, I think that's a great idea. About the Yep. Somebody Yep. First. Erica's question is about, um, do you have pre-installed programs for testing be, uh, Unity or using students beyond testing Unity? And then do you give a generic user login to operate Steam or Oculus for folks to get access to those pre-installed programs? So right now we're setting up Steam um, as, it's, it's a, <laughs> that person is entering the same world that we are, right? Yeah. Um, uh, so Steam kind of has an arcade option. However, we don't think it works very well. So we're working with a company called Springboard. Uh, so if you're interested in providing kind of a multi-station VR access, uh, we would recommend checking out Springboard. Um, it's similar to e an ebook platform, perhaps is a, is a good analogy. Uh, we can um, rent out games for students to use when they want them slash need them. Springboard also has some really um, heavy lifting educational um, experiences or, or programs in there, including a really well-known anatomy uh, one. So that, that would be my recommendation for them, for, for anybody who's looking to provide VR, because that, we're hoping that also solves our problem. You know, computer science is, is diving into VR and needs to provide access to their students. So it's the psychology and it's just growing across campus. So hopefully we'll be able to kind of do a campus license. Um, we're still working this all out with them, but they seem much more receptive uh, than the, the STEAM crew. And Tara's absolutely right. What we've been operating with primarily is Right, you're a student, you have a login, log on to the computer, you've got your Steam profile. Um, go for it and use that. The downside of it is that within Steam, if you have particular <laughs> games that are your favorite to use, they show up on the default profile. And if that default profile isn't wiped, then the next person that logs on sees games or, or tools that aren't necessarily available to them because they haven't mentioned it. So it is a problem. I'd say a third option that we're working with right now as part of the, the, the State Council of Libraries, we just rolled out, gosh, 19 VR headsets to branch libraries around the, the state. And we're working with a third party vendor to, to offer this environment where folks that develop and create new content can share it uh, free of charge with, with others across the platform. So it's an ugly, scary, IP mind written landscape that we're entering. Uh, but we're all trying to figure out how to do the same thing. And Tara was also going to mention uh, the, the students that are over there working on the laser cutter. Entirely comfortable. Oh. Mm -hmm. do it short. Nice. Does that answer that or speak to the question even though none of us has the answer yet? <laughs> yes, she said. Yay. Yes. Have we lost uh, audio? No. Nope. Am I talking? I'm talking and oh. I was muted. Thank uh -huh. you so much for taking the time to um, meet and work with us today. I've learned a ton. Um, as you were chatting, I was also including links to some of the specific equipment that you were yeah. calling out around the room because um, 
I added those to our wish list. We're spending <laughs> the summer developing proposal after proposal, which is something I learned from you at one point, Todd, that you had established a set of proposals so that when donors, potential donors come along, you can say, well, we need this. Are you interested in that? Um, so we've been doing that lately. You're well, talking, but I can't hear you. There you are. Oh, yeah. well, well done, Amy, and congrats. I mean, in fact, I was just saying to, to Tara, we didn't even get it off the floor, but up on the second floor, we had the, the sound booth, which was the result of exactly one of those kind of proposals. You know, that a donor didn't have the funds to endow something that was $20,000 a year, but they were entirely comfortable with a one-shot injection of $20,000 that made the sound booth possible. That's once, cool. Once you get that base level there, we can support it. We can take it from that point. But uh, sometimes it's just that 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 grain, that kernel that the rest of the service gets built around, that, that barrier is too high for us to get over as a library. We were successful with a proposal recently as well by having another campus entity fund it. And so um, we developed the one button studio like the one at Penn State in our library. So now we have that funded, which is great. And it's it's ready, it's going, which is awesome. Nice. Well, and I wanted to, I wanted to at least take one moment and, and give a shout out to you, Amy, and, and your colleagues that are hosting these virtual webinars. This is the only way that we figure out how to do things, right? That's right. The sincerest form of, of, of uh, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. And I'm actively looking forward to stealing some ideas from, from colleagues around the country. That's a great note to end on. Thank you for saying that, Todd. And thanks. Cheers to Erica, who's been doing these alongside with me. She's here and she's about to leave right at two. Thank you so much, Todd and Tara, for your time today, especially on the last day of finals. My goodness, you must be so hectically busy. Um, I appreciate it so much. Well, that's it. I'll stop the recording. <laughs>